wooden structures on Earth have lasted as long as 1,300 years and were built with intentionally burned wood. This burning process transforms the outer surface and forms a protective layer that is highly resistant to decay or destruction by the elements. Sometimes life can be intense. We can find ourselves burned by bad choices or by difficult circumstances. Scripture is filled with examples of women and men who encountered difficulty, experienced transformation, and were able to overcome. When the heat of life intensifies, God wants to work in your life and make you resilient. A few months ago, during the height of the pandemic, when many of us were spending time at home, we started watching a new program. I can't remember what streaming service it was on, or maybe it was on TV, I can't remember. But the show is called Alone. I don't know if you're familiar with this show. As I think about it, I'm not sure a show called Alone is the best show to watch while you're in isolation during a pandemic. But we couldn't turn away from this show. It's one of these reality survival shows. They take 10 people, I think, usually, and they put them in the middle of the wilderness. There aren't any scripts. There aren't any actors. There's no director on set. There aren't even professionals behind the cameras. They actually give these individuals all this camera equipment and batteries, and they have to film themselves the whole time. They are literally alone. That's the name of the show. And they take them up in the Arctic somewhere, north of Canada or the northern part of Canada, typically, and it's freezing cold. They get to choose a few items to take with them, but basically they just have to survive on their own. They have to build their own shelters. They have to start their own fires. They have to hunt or pick or fish or trap food and then prepare it and cook it and eat it. And, and it's, it's, so it's just, it's really interesting to watch this unfold. I, I, you know, I think I would probably last about until lunch the next day, maybe. You know, they're eating squirrels, and, and, and um, you know, I'd have to check out on that. They're scraping certain kinds of mushrooms, and I don't know. They're, uh, I couldn't do it. But I love to watch it from the comfort of my living room. Every one of these men and women out there have a satellite phone. And the idea is if you get sick, too sick, or you get injured, or you just can't take it any longer, you get too hungry, or whatever the case may be, too cold, you can tap out. You just call and say, I'm out, come get me. And they'll send a helicopter or a boat and they'll come get you and, and take you back. And so the idea is the last one standing is a winner and they win the money. And as we're watching this, you know, you start to sort of make predictions on who you think will last the longest. And sometimes it's surprising. The ones who last aren't the ones you think and the ones who check out early aren't the ones you think will do that. There may be people, men and women, who served in the military, uh, you know, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, people who hike all the time, who teach survival skills, and you think, oh, they're going to last a long time. They'll, they'll probably win this thing. You know, people who hunt and fish, they live off the land, and that's what they like doing, and you think, okay, they're going to, you know, they're going to blast throughout this whole thing, days, weeks, months, and some of them do last that long. But there's always that one or two, or maybe more, who check out early. And it's not because they're sick, it's not because they're injured, it's not because they're hurt, it's not because they are just, they can't take the physical aspects of it any longer. They're not necessarily hungry, they may even have food, but they tap out because they are terribly lonely. Isn't that interesting? As some of their items, many of them take photographs, photographs of their family. And you know when you see one of those people get that photograph out and just start staring at it and start talking to it, you think, okay, they're not long for this thing. They're going to they're gonna check out early because their heart is somewhere else. They're not there. They are slowly being pulled back. They miss their family. They miss their kids. They miss conversations. They miss dinner time. They miss being with those they love. And so what do they do? They can take the physical, they can take the cold, they can take the hunger, they can take all of that, but they can't take the isolation. I find that to be fascinating. And I think many of us sometimes live our lives the same way. Not the frozen tundra of the Arctic way, but the isolation way. You know, many of us, most of us, virtually all of us, are surrounded by lots of people, and yet sometimes we feel alone, don't we? 
If we've learned anything over the past year and a half, we know that we are connected in this global community online. All you got to do is go to your device and you can connect with anyone, anywhere. And yet, we feel lonely sometimes. Have you ever felt alone? They say that loneliness is an epidemic. And they said that before the pandemic. So imagine what it is now. But maybe you know what it's like to feel that way. To have the isolation, the feelings of loneliness be so strong that you find yourself in despair. Maybe you've always prayed for a mate, and for whatever reason, it just hasn't happened yet. Maybe you have gone through loss and severe suffering, and you look around, and the world around you just seems to be going on with their lives. And you are forgotten, or it feels like you're forgotten. Maybe you know what it's like to be misunderstood, to be left out, to be excluded, to not be someone who's in the in group, but on the outside for whatever reason. And it can be a lonely place, the isolation, being on an island. As we continue in this series we're calling Resilient, we look at men and women in the Bible who didn't have everything together. They weren't perfect. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. That gives me encouragement. Because we hold these Bible characters up, and we're about to study Joseph up here. And we hold Joseph up as a, as a hero, and in many ways he is. But he's also just a person. And there are women and men throughout Scripture who are just people. And sometimes they are dealt a bad hand in life. And sometimes they make bad decisions in life. And sometimes they are dealt a bad hand, and they make bad decisions. Sometimes life is difficult. And yet, God is at work. God is working to redeem their pain, to restore their lives, to rewrite their stories. God is at work in their lives. And that gives me great hope. That gives me great encouragement, knowing that God can do that for us as well. Elijah was someone like that. We hold Elijah up as a Bible hero, and in many ways he is. But he's also just a person. And Elijah knew exactly what it felt like to be alone. In fact, listen to his words that pour out of his broken spirit to God as he cries out to God. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 10, he says to the Lord, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Elijah says to God, look around because I am God and I don't see anybody who's on our side, on our team. I am the only one left. And now I am in the crosshairs of my enemies. It gets so bad that Elijah says, I'm done. He picks up the satellite phone. He pushes the button and he says, I'm tapping out. I can't take this anymore. Verse 4 of 19, I have had enough, Lord, he said, take my life. You say, wow, how did we get there? How did we arrive at this point? How did this man of God, this guy we often call the fiery prophet, how did he get to the point where he is ready to give up? He is ready to tap out. What happened? Well, we need to rewind the tape a little bit. We need to go back and see what unfolded to cause him to reach this place. There is a drought throughout the land, a severe drought, unlike what we have had this past week. Anybody else have trouble finding time to mow your yard? <laughs> well, there was a severe drought in the land. The people are parched. The land is dry, and something has got to give. Something has got to change. Maybe God is holding back the rain as a wake-up call for his people because his people have turned their backs on him. And maybe in, in this way, he's trying to jar them awake, trying to get their attention. Specifically, King Ahab has married a pagan princess named Jezebel. Already, you know, that sounds bad, Jezebel. He's married Jezebel. Jezebel worships this pagan god, Baal. And not only does she worship Baal and bow down to Baal rather than Yahweh God, but she now has gotten her husband, King Ahab, to bow down to Baal. And not only that, but she has convinced him that all the prophets of Yahweh God need to be exterminated. 
Well, if you are an Israelite, if you bow down to Yahweh God, and you know that people of God are being exterminated, that sends a message. And so people, one by one, cluster by cluster, are turning away from God, turning toward this pagan God, Baal. Things are bad. And so the need for rain actually prompts this showdown, this standoff. King Ahab and Elijah. But the showdown, the standoff, is not between these men. It's between their respective deities, Baal and God. Everything was prepared for the showdown at Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal, they set up an altar, and they began calling on the name of their pagan god, Baal. And the idea was, let's see which god answers. They build this altar, they put the, the bull on top of it, and Baal is supposed to send fire down and burn up the sacrifice. And so the prophets of Baal, 450, they're everywhere. They're calling out the name of Baal, asking for him to respond. Nothing happens. No fire. And so they call out even more desperately. Surely even maybe a bolt of lightning. After all, Baal is the storm god. He's billed as the storm god. So surely the storm gods can send down lightning, a spark, something. Give us something, but nothing. Crickets. Radio silence. It gets so bad that they begin to cut themselves in an act of desperation. God, look what we're doing. Pagan god Baal, look what we're doing. Look to the, the links that we are going. You know, meet us halfway. Do something here. Nothing. After it's all said and done, there's just a bunch of bloody prophets and no fire. Then it's Elijah's turn. It's his turn to, turn to call on Yahweh God, his God, our God, the God of the universe. And so he has to rebuild the altar because it is in disarray as a symbol of how the people have turned their backs on God. So he gets the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes. He rebuilds the altar. He puts wood on the altar. He cuts up the bull and puts it on top of the altar. And he has people pour 12 large jars or buckets, we might say, of water on top of the altar. So much so that it fills the moat that he has dug around the altar. And now it's time. And from a human perspective, you say, well, this, this doesn't seem fair. From a human, from, from a logical perspective, we have 450 people dressed out for the team over here on Team Baal. We have one over here on Team Yahweh God. And then we have this drenched altar, and we're supposed to have sparks, and it's supposed to light up. There's supposed to be fire from heaven. From a logical human perspective, this didn't look good. This didn't look good for God. This didn't look good for Elijah. But Elijah understands who God is, and that God is. And so he calls on his God. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36 at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and even licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord is God. The Lord, He is God. Can you imagine being there and seeing this? With all heads tilted upward, with all eyes looking to the sky, waiting, wondering, will there be fire? Will there be lightning? Will there be something? And then God sends down this thunderous, blazing fire that vaporizes everything. <laughs> Can you imagine? The people saw it, and they couldn't say otherwise. It was undeniable. God is God. There is only one God, and it's not this pagan god, Baal. It is Yahweh God. Now, you talk about a revival. 
That's a revival. People turning back to God. And then God sent something else from the skies. This time he finally sent rain. Isn't it interesting? In this story, we talk about the fire from heaven. We talk about Elijah exterminating the prophets of Baal by the sword. We talk about the power and the force of God. We often miss the provision of God. He provides rain for his people. And so he sends rain on the land. What a day. What a day for Elijah. What, could, what more could you ask for? God defeats the pagan god Baal. Elijah is validated as a prophet of God. There's rain on the land. It's a good day. But here's the problem. We don't live life on the mountaintop. There is always a valley waiting for us. There's always a valley below. We can't live life at summer camp, can we? We can't live life on a mission trip. We can't live life on that spiritual high or that worship experience. There's always school starting in the fall. There's always a job waiting back at home. There's always people who need things, demands and calendars and meetings. There's always toxic people and difficult situations and money problems. There's always a valley. Wouldn't it be nice if we could live life on the mountaintop? If every moment of every day God revealed himself in a powerful way that was undeniable and we were a part of that. But the truth is we have to come down into the valleys. That was certainly the case for Elijah. Chapter 19, verse 1. Look at the form that his valley takes. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Apparently, Jezebel didn't like what happened at Mount Carmel. She was not a fan. In fact, she was so upset that she threatens to kill Elijah. And he knows that she has the power and the resources to get it done. And so how does he respond? Verse 3, Elijah was afraid, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Elijah is wrecked with fear. And what does God do? Remember what I said about God's provision? He sent rain down for his people. Notice what he does here. He sends an angel to Elijah. Elijah is asleep. The angel wakes up Elijah. Can you imagine being awoken by an angel? The angel gives him food and water. Elijah dozes off again. The angel wakes him back up and gives him more food and prepares him for what is next. And what is next is a 40-day journey to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, the place where Moses ascended to receive the law, that holy place, Mount Sinai. That's where he goes. And maybe he goes there to encounter God in his own way, to get reassurance from God. Maybe he goes there to retrace the steps of Moses. There are a lot of parallels between Elijah and Moses throughout this text. We aren't sure why he goes there. But he goes to the mountain of God, and he hides in a cave. Maybe he just goes there to run away because he's afraid. Chapter 19, verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. There was a rushing wind, and there was a rumbling earthquake, and there was a blazing fire. And there are all kinds of theories and speculations about what God was doing through those natural acts, those acts of nature, we might say. What was God doing there? 
We aren't for sure what was happening. But if God was trying to get Elijah to come out of his cave, literally his cave, but also his dark cave symbolically, it didn't work. And finally, God sends this gentle breeze or this gentle whisper. And Elijah comes out of the cave. But he comes out, and apparently he is unmoved, he is unchanged, because what happens? He gives the same speech. God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah just pushes play. He just launches into the speech. He's ready. God, maybe you didn't hear me, but I have been faithful to you. I am the only one who is faithful to you. All of Israel has turned their backs on you. They're killing the prophets of yours. I am the last one. God, do you see this? Elijah feels alone, and he is afraid. How could Elijah be so afraid? That's the question I have when I look at this. How could he be so afraid after what he witnessed? Not just witnessed on the sidelines as a, as a, as a fan or an onlooker, but he was on the playing field. He was right there in the middle of it. He built the altar. He called on God. He was right there to experience. He felt the heat of the fire. How, one chapter later, is he so afraid? Does he feel all alone? Did somehow he miss the point at Mount Carmel? Did he just miss it? Was he so wrapped up in the details that he missed the bigger picture? A few years ago when we got to go to Israel, we visited Mount Carmel. On top of Mount Carmel, there is a monastery. Next to the monastery, there is a statue of Elijah with a sword slaying the prophets of Baal. You can go on top of the monastery, and the sight is just incredible. The view is incredible. You can see pretty much in all directions. It's a beautiful area, a great place. So we're up there sort of taking it all in, thinking about this story and other things that have happened there, and, and just sort of pondering that and thinking through that. And that's when I chose to ask our, our tour guide a question. We had, this was toward the end of our trip, so we, he and I had, had lots of conversations, and we kind of had this connection. He was Jewish-Israeli, but he really wasn't Jewish by religion, and he wasn't Christian, but he was intrigued by some of the ideas of Christianity, and he, he liked those. And so we had some great conversations throughout our time there. And so I felt like, you know, we have a pretty good relationship. I can ask him anything. And I said, I've got to ask you a question, something I've wondered for a long time. Maybe you can help me. He said, what is it? I said, when Elijah went against the prophets of Baal, and they had the altar, and the fire came down, all of that right here in this spot. I said it was in the middle of a severe drought. Where did they get the 12 large jarfuls of water that they poured onto the altar? I mean, you know, water was so precious. Did they take some of the precious water reserves that they have? Did they go to the Mediterranean Sea that's nearby? I mean, it is nearby, but man, that's still a long haul. How long did that take? Where did they get the water? <laughs> and he just kind of looked at me and grinned. <laughs> and he said, fire came down from heaven and consumed everything. And you're asking about the source of the water? <laughs> hmm. Well, I was asking for a friend. I know where it came from, but someone else wanted to know. So, I... He said, that, that is just like you Westerners. Oh, ouch. Insult to injury. That's just like you Western. He wasn't being critical. He wasn't being mean. He said, that's just like the Western mindset. So rational. He said, a Jewish person would never ask that question. They wouldn't even ask that question. That's not how their brain thinks. And I got to tell you, I'll be honest. I have thought about that conversation many, many times. How do I read the Bible? How do I interpret scripture? What questions am I asking? Are they the right questions? What am I missing? You see, what he was telling me is, <laughs> you're missing the point. The point is God showed up in a big way and did a great thing. And you're worried about the source of the water? And I look at Elijah and I think, did you somehow miss the point? Did you just miss what God did there? Were you so wrapped up in the details? Were you so worried about what was happening next? Did you miss God? So often we miss the wonder 
and the mystery and the awe of God. Because we're either caught up in the details or we're worried about our circumstances and we miss God. You see, isolation produces anxiety. There is no doubt. Isolation produces anxiety, and anxiety begins to write this script in our head. And this script is filled with lies that we listen to and often believe. We say things like Elijah said, I'm the only one left. But we don't say that, or maybe we do. I'm the only one trying to do the right thing in this company, or in this family, or in this friend group. Or, no one understands me. No one gets me. Or, they excluded me on purpose. No one likes me. We say these things. We exaggerate. We think everyone is against us. If we get one bit of criticism, we think everyone's against us. You see, that's what anxiety does. It writes a script filled with lies that we believe. Elijah said, I'm the only one. Had he forgotten? Had he forgotten about the hundred prophets of God that Obadiah had hid in two different caves? At the beginning of chapter 18, that's what happens. Obadiah hides a hundred prophets of God. You say, well, maybe, maybe Elijah didn't get the memo. No, he and Obadiah have a conversation about it. He knows. Has he forgotten that? Has he forgotten what just happened at the great revival at Mount Carmel? When all these Israelites turned toward Yahweh God? Did he not know that there were thousands, literally thousands of people in the land who had not bowed down to the pagan god Baal? God reminds him of that in 1 Kings 19, verse 18. He says, there are 7,000 in Israel who haven't worshipped Baal. How did Elijah miss all of that? You see, God's message to Elijah is pretty simple, and it's this. Elijah, you are not alone. You're not alone. Look around. There are others. There are other prophets of mine. There are other people of mine. You are not alone. But here's the thing that is so important as we apply this. Even if he was literally the only one, let's say it's true. He truly was the only prophet. He truly was the only person who didn't turn their backs on God. Even if that was the case, he would still not be alone. And you are not alone. You are never alone. God is with you. God is with you. God was with Elijah. The God who sends fire from heaven. The God who sends rain from heaven. To provide the God who sends mighty winds and rumbling earthquakes and blazing fires and gentle whispers. You see, that whole thing, I think, was to tell Elijah that I'm still here. Elijah, I'm here. I will always be here. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You see, a big part of Elijah's problem was that his focus was shifted. It was in the wrong place. Look back very quickly at at chapter 18 and notice the nature of his language as he prepares for this showdown at Mount Carmel. Chapter 18, verse 36. After building an altar, rebuilding the altar, in the name of the Lord, it says, at the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, uh, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant, and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their backs, their hearts back again. You see where his, where his emphasis, where his focus is? It's all about God. God, you are this. Show your people who you are. I'm with you. Let's go. One chapter later, chapter 19, verse 4. I have had enough. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Verse 14. I have been very zealous for the Lord. He goes on and on. And then he says, I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. (laughs) You can see the difference. It went from looking up to God, acknowledging God, to looking around at how difficult life is for me. But don't we do that sometimes? We often lose hope when we lose focus. 
when we go from looking up and acknowledging God to looking around and looking inside and seeing how bad it is and how I wish things were different and how I don't want to be dealing with this. So what's the answer? How do we get out of that dark cave? That dark cave of despair and isolation and discouragement. Notice how God leads Elijah out of the cave. Chapter 19, verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Melahora to succeed you as prophet. Lots of good names there. But I want you to see what God calls, calls Elijah to do. You see, Elijah might be done, might feel like he's done, but God is not done with Elijah. God says, Elijah, we got work to do. I need you to go here. I need you to anoint this person. I need you to anoint your successor, Elisha. There is work to do. God's will continues. You see, I think what God is telling Elijah is that he needs to refocus. Refocus on God and renew your purpose in and for God. It's about purpose. God had a plan to neutralize any threat against his people, any threat against his will being done. And a part of that plan involved recommissioning Elijah. That's what chapter 19 is really about. And it reflects the call narratives throughout Scripture. It has the same elements. It has the complaint. It has the signs, the symbols. It's just like many of the call narratives. And that's what it is. It's a recalling, a recommissioning of Elijah. Elijah, get out of the cave. Stop moping. Stop looking around. Stop saying that you're the only one. You're not dealing in reality. Get out of the cave because we got work to do. Church, we have work to do. And, and don't mishear me. I'm not saying feelings of isolation or loneliness are not real, are not valid. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying those can be tempered through a sense of purpose in God. That doesn't mean they're going to go away. But when we refocus on the things that God wants us to focus on, things seem to get better. We're reminded that we're not alone, that we have a community around us, and maybe we just need to engage that community. We need to spend time with people. We need to interact with people and fellowship and serve together. And we need to be about our purpose, our God-given purpose, to bring light into this dark world, to make disciples, to advance the cause of Christ, to make much of Jesus in our world, to have some focus. I heard a story recently about an older lady. She lived by herself, and she was feeling all alone because, you know, her family and her friends, they, they had their lives and they had stuff to do, and so she didn't get a lot of contact. They didn't have a lot of contact with her, and so she, she just felt lonely. So she prayed about it. And she prayed and she prayed. She lived in a town with a large university virtually across the street from her. It was very close. And as she prayed, this idea began to formulate. She said, you know, I bet there are students there at that university who are homesick. She said, maybe I can do something. So she had this sort of strange yet very simple idea. She got a stack of those three by five index cards and she hand wrote on there, are you homesick? Question mark. If so, join me at four o'clock for tea. <laughs> then she put her name and her phone number and her address. That was it. Are you homesick? If so, join me at four o'clock for tea. And she distributed him throughout campus there. And at first, nothing really happened. But then, someone showed up. And then more showed up. And students started showing up at four o'clock at her house for tea. Ten years later, she passed away. At her funeral, she had 80 honorary pallbearers, young men and women who had been college students, who had spent time at her table, in her house, having tea, and being loved and supported by her. You see, sometimes what we need is just to renew our sense of purpose, to find what God's purpose for our lives is at this point in life.
How can I make much of Jesus? How can I shine light into this dark world? How can I be used by God to make disciples? And when we find that purpose, we live with hope and joy and meaning. And I think we also share that purpose with those around us, which brings people into our lives, which fills that emotional, relational tank. So if you feel alone, let me just encourage you to look up, to look at God, and to adore God, and to not miss the mystery and the awe and the wonder that is God. And in the midst of worshiping God and being captured by who God is, receive your sense of purpose from him and renew your purpose in him and let him work in your life and through you. Refocus on God and renew your purpose. I want you to know that not only is God present, but this church family is here. And we don't always know what's going on in each other's lives, do we? It's hard to keep up with each other, especially we've been separate. We're coming back together. It's kind of hard to keep up with each other. You know, I see kids that I think are, you know, this tall, and then I haven't seen them in a year and a half, and, you know, they're driving, their voice has changed. (laughs) It's hard to keep up with each other. And I know, I know that sometimes you feel like no one at church cares about me, or no one knows what I'm going through. I understand. I get it. But help us know. Help someone around you know. Someone in your Bible class. Reach out to someone. If, if we can encourage you, please let us do that. Well, you should know. Well, maybe we should. Maybe we can't. But help us. So if you can go to our prayer page and reach out there. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing a song. A couple of our shepherds and their wives will be in the parlor. It's a little room right behind me in that hallway. You can go out any of these doors. Walk behind the stage area through that hallway and go in the parlor they'd be happy to encourage you pray for you or you can come down to the front and we as a church family will encourage you maybe today you're ready to make that commitment to christ to give your life to christ to confess that you believe jesus is the son of god to be baptized into christ and come up that new creation ready to live for him i can assure you this church family will celebrate with you and encourage you in that if there's something we can do we invite you to come as we stand and sing